بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبع. All right. So we left off at section thirteen of Surah Al Imran, and just for a quick review, who can tell me what number surah is this surah in the Quran? Yes, second close. What? I'm not gonna say no cigars. That's not good because we don't want cigars anyways. But close. Uh, in the back there. Yes. What? Third? Did you say third? You got it. Third. All right, so I'm at Kasur Fatiha, then Baqarah. It's the second long surah in the Quran. All right, and we're at verse 121, and we did this, but we'll review it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قَدَوْتَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ تُبَوِّئُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ بَقَاعِدَ لِلْقِتَالِ Think about when you left your home in the early morning to position the believers in the battlefield. The Prophet is being told this. Which battle are they talking about? Can anybody tell me which battle are you talking about? Yes. The battle of Uhud. Very good. And who can tell me what it says? It doesn't even say Uhud in the Quran. But what is Uhud? Besides where a battle took place. Like what is it actually? Yes. It's a mountain. Next to Mecca or next to Jerusalem? Jerusalem? No. It was a trick question. Neither of those two. Yes. Next to Medina. <laughs> it's next to Medina. All right. And the verse continues. Wallahu sami'un alim. Allah is hearing and knowing. Meaning Allah is hearing. Allah knows everything that was said over there. So, and he knows everything that happened there. So the, he's talking about the battle of Uhud. When Allah says Allah is hearing, he knows all the conversations about what? We need to leave our home. We need to go out to fight. You people stay in this position. There's a battle coming. You people stay in this position. Right? So Allah heard all of the conversations that were taking place and the people agreeing and saying, you know what? We'll stay where we're supposed to stay. We'll do what we're supposed to do and what the other army is coming to do and everything. So we are talking about the battle of Badr and some recap about this. The battle of, uh, sorry, we're talking about the battle of Ahr. And the recap was that the Battle of Uhud took place in the month of Shawwal in the year 3 AH. So what does AH stand for? Somebody in the back, yes. After Hijrah. And Hijrah refers to the migration. Okay, the migration from Mecca to Medina. So this happened, this Battle of Uhud happened about 12 months after the Battle of Badr. So it's like a revenge that the Quraysh tribe that's living in Mecca, they want to get revenge because the Muslims won the Battle of Badr. So 3,000 Quraysh soldiers who are heavily armed, they're coming and they're marching upon Medina to go and attack the Muslims. How many of them were wearing chainmail? Who remembers? Ali? Uh, All yeah, right, you, you got the first number correct. <laughs> Somebody help him with the second. Jabba. 700 people had chainmail and how many horses did they have? Horses are super fast. So compared to camels, if you were to see a camel in a horse race, who would you, you can't gamble as Muslims, but if you had to bet your money on somebody, who would you go with? Yeah, the horse, right? So horses are super fast. So in war, they're like advanced technology. How many horses did Quraysh have? Anyone remember? No one remembers? I'll just tell you, 200. Hey, you remember? Did you say 200? Okay, mashallah, you got it. There's 200 cavalry, 200 horses, and they're coming, and they're going to attack the city. So the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, consults with the believers and asks, should we go outside and meet them, or should we defend the city of Medina from the inside? And we talked about this part, right? I think we left off at this last point, which I did mention. There was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Ubay, ibn Salud. Did we talk about him or not? We didn't talk about him. Okay. We did? Oh, okay. So, and, and he, just a little bit, right? So he was the leader of the hypocrites. He's pretending to be Muslim. And he goes out, and his opinion was that we should stay inside Medina and defend the city because it's easier, less casualties, less risk, less danger. So when he goes out, because the Prophet had decided that we're going to go out. When they went out, as soon as they're leaving, there's only 1,000 Muslims. And there's 3,000 Quraysh coming to attack the Muslims. So they're outnumbered. So what happens? Abdullah ibn Ubay 
after what, marching out a little bit from Medina, he says, you know what? If this guy is talking to about the problem, and he's pretending to be Muslim, if this guy is not going to respect my opinion, and he's not going to care about our opinions and stuff like that, then why should we join him? This is not a this is not a good battle. A thousand against three thousand, we're, we're we're in big trouble. We're not gonna get killed for no reason. So he left with three hundred of his soldiers, and they all went back to Medina. So now the Muslim army is down to how many people? Seven hundred versus three thousand, almost four times larger. The enemy is four times larger. Now what happened was the battle of Bakr began, and initially the Muslims were victorious. They were about to win the battle. And the Prophet, here it says, right here in the Quran, he's positioned the believers in the battlefield. We talked about the importance of following the leader, the importance of being organized. So what did the Prophet, peace be upon him, do? He said, listen, you guys need to be here. You guys need to be here. You need to be there. And he set a group of archers, about 50 archers, on a little hill. And he said, you guys need to stay here. No matter what happens, do not leave this position. Why? Because the Prophet saw that around the back of this little hill was a place where they could launch an attack if they have 200 horses. They have 200 cavalry. So they could go when the armies are fighting each other like this, someone could go around the back corner and they could attack the Muslims from the back. And what you do is, in military strategy, if you study military strategy, there's a lot of books. Like the oldest book is like Sun Tzu's Art of War. There's many, many other books out there. So there's an attack where if you can get your army to squeeze people from in between, attack them from both sides. Does anyone know what this type of attack is called? Hmm? Not ambush. What is it called? Fl and so flanking is one type, but it's a little bit different. It's a pincer attack, right? So this is, this is what the Prophet, peace be upon him, was trying to prevent from happening. So what ends up happening is that the Muslims were originally victorious and they're going after the spoils of war and the enemy's retreating. And the archers, many of them, they come down and they're like, you know what, the battle's over. It's okay, we're good to go. So let's go and collect some of the leftover money that's there. Because what happens in a battle, there's something called spoils of war. When people are running away, they have all of these, you know, they have in their tent maybe some of their money, they have their armor, they'll like throw their armor down so that they can run away. Imagine that chain mail and stuff, right? Said 700 of the Quraysh have chain mail on. Now, chain mail can be a little bit heavy. Uh, it's also very expensive to make. So, imagine someone's running away trying to save themselves because they think they lost the battle. What might they do? They might throw their helmet down, take off the chain mail, throw it down, and they're just going to run away so they can save themselves. And guess what? That's expensive chain mail. That's an expensive, like, helmet armor that you had on. The Muslims were poor, they didn't have all this stuff. So, they're like, hey, you know what? There's a bunch of stuff on the floor for the picking. Like, this is a free-for-all. Who, who's going to get it first? So the, some of the archers, they say, you know what? If we don't get down from the hill right now, we're going to miss out. You know, we got some, some good money being left behind. And someone, let's say, imagine someone throwing money on the floor. And you're like, you're just going to sit here? Okay, let's go get some of that. So they got off the hill. A few of them stayed, but many of them got off the hill. When they got off the hill, what did they end up doing? They ended up disobeying prophet's orders. It's very clear orders. Do not move from this hill no matter what. So what ends up happening is one of the men by the name of Khalid ibn Walid, who was from the side of Quraysh, he goes and he gets 100 of his cavalry and his expert horsemen. And 100 of them go around the back and since there's not enough archers there, they go and they actually kill off the archers and they go and attack the Muslims from the back. The people who are running away, what do they do? They turn around and they re-attack back and they squeeze the Muslims into a pincer attack and the Muslims lost the battle. Now it was really bad. This was the defeat of the Battle of Bakr. So imagine after the Battle of Bakr, first battle in the history of Islam. The Muslims are very happy. They were outnumbered. Allah gave them victory. Their reputation is becoming more and more you know, prominent. Because they were oppressed all this time. For 13 years they were being persecuted. Now, the reputation is good. All these Muslims were victorious. They were able to defeat the Quraysh. And now, with the Battle of Ahud, that reputation is all back to zero. The Muslims lost. You know, if they were on the true path, how could they lose? What's happening? So Allah is telling us about the Battle of Ahud here and the loss at the Battle of Ahud. إِذْ <laughs> 
Think about when two groups among you were about to withdraw and Allah was their protector. So it's basically talking about in the beginning, when the Muslims were leaving Medina to participate in the Battle of Uhud, what happened with this Abdullah ibn Ubay guy? He took his 300 people and he left. So the 300 people left, the Muslim armies down to 700. There were two other families who were just about to leave too. Can, can you imagine if someone does something like that? You, you know, if somebody does something that like demoralizes everybody else, everyone else feels down too. So they were thinking, you know what? We should leave too. This guy left, but we're even less numbers. 700 versus 3,000? We should go too. I think we're in a dangerous place. We should have stayed in the city and defended the city instead. So there were two groups who were about to withdraw and they were about to leave. But Allah says, Wallahu waliyuma. But Allah was their protector. Allah reassured them and then they had a change of heart. And they said, no, we're Muslims. We're going to stay with the Prophet. Whatever the Prophet decides, we're going to stay with him. And what's really interesting is that when Ibn Ubay left with his 300 soldiers, what did Allah say about it in the Quran? Who knows? Who knows what he said? Anyone? He, he said nothing. He ignored them, which is a really interesting. Basically, he's like, this guy, hypocrites, they don't even deserve mention in this case. They don't even, they don't even deserve to be addressed. We're just gonna ignore them and we're gonna focus on these two groups. So Allah mentioned these two groups and how their heart changed. He just ignored the other group. Those people, there's no goodness in them. These people, they wavered, but they had goodness in them. And what happened was later on, when the when the people from these two families, when they saw this verse was revealed, they got extremely happy. You know why they got happy? Because it's actually criticizing them. Say, you know what? You guys almost gave up. Like you guys almost left. That's like that's bad. But you know what made them happy? The word minku. Think about when two groups among you. So because Allah said that they're among you, meaning these two groups are among the category of believers, they basically gave them the sense that, hey, we, Allah has given us the status of being with the group of Muslims. Like we count as being part of the, officially part of the group that made them very happy. So uh, this was something that, you know, Allah mentioned. And then he said, so let the believers put their trust in Allah. When you put your trust in Allah, it means you don't hesitate. You don't hesitate to do the right thing. When it's time to do the right thing, trust Allah, and you know you're doing the right thing, continue doing the right thing. And there's a good lesson here. It's also that passing thoughts that come to your mind, they're not the same as bad deeds. So when you have a thought, you're like, you know, I feel like cheating on my test. You know, or I feel like, you know, someone makes you really mad. Feel like pushing that person or that you like, no, but I should do that. I'm a Muslim, I should do that. Passing thoughts are in a completely different category than the bad deeds that you actually do, or you're like plotting and planning it out. This is how I'm gonna impact on upon it or something. So this is a very good lesson for all of us that you know what? Sometimes thoughts come to our mind. Sometimes we feel weak, sometimes we feel like you know, we can't do something. Then when you put your trust in Allah, you get reassurance, you say, No, I can do this. It's okay. This happens to people. People will hesitate. It's part of part of being a human being. And uh, you don't need to beat yourself up about it when you hesitate for something like that. Allah helped you at Badr when you were outnumbered. Meaning when you were badly outnumbered. So, uh, who can remind me what is Badr? What is, what is it talking about Badr? Yes, what is Badr? That's right, exactly. The war, the first battle where the Muslims won because Allah helped them even though they were still outnumbered. So now Allah was just talking about Uhud, the battle of Uhud. Now he's going back one year. And why is he going back one year? Because the people at Uhud, when they're about to go out, they're feeling, you know, we're outnumbered. This is really difficult. This is going to be hard. So Allah goes and says, wait a minute. Didn't Allah just help you a year ago? Like, didn't, didn't everything work out at Badr? He's saying, remember, Allah helped you at brother and you were outnumbered. So the way you were outnumbered there, you're also outnumbered here. So why are you getting so scared? Like, what, what's wrong with you guys? Everything was fine before. Allah can help you again. So you don't need to worry about it. So 
Allah is reminding them of the blessing that he gave them at Badr by allowing them to be victorious. So he's saying, keep trusting in Allah so you're going to also be given victory at Uhud as well. And what Badr actually is, is Badr is, uh, we have a, thank you. All right. So Badr is actually a camping ground and it's a marketplace where people would stop. The Badr is about 20 miles southwest of the city of Medina, not that far from Medina. And it's a place that has a lot of water, a lot of wells. Uh, and you can go there and people would be on their caravan route and they would go to refill their water and things like that. So when they came in the Battle of Badr, the Muslims only had 70 camels and two horses. Like they were very, very minimally equipped. So they really didn't have that much. And yet, they were still victorious. Right? Be mindful of Allah so that you might be grateful. So remember Allah, be, you know, be thinking about Allah so that you can be thankful and grateful for all the blessings that you've been given. So the, the key here is when you are mindful of Allah, when you are conscious of Allah, you get victory. When you get victory, like at Badr, you become grateful to Allah. You thank Allah for the blessings and then he gives you more blessings. So this is the way things are supposed to work normal. And then Allah says, Reflect when you, being the Prophet, said to the believers, Is it, isn't it enough that your Lord will send down a reinforcement of 3,000 angels to help you? So basically it's saying that, you know what? When, when the Muslims heard that reinforcements are coming, this is the Battle of Badr, Reinforcements are on their way, and they're from coming from Quraysh to come and attack you. Imagine what the Muslims felt like. They're like, this is all about Badr, okay, right now. We're not about Uhud anymore. We're going back one year, all talking about the Battle of Badr. So what happened was the Battle of Badr, the Muslims went out, and they were going, and they were about to fight with the caravan. Small, small group. In Mecca, the Quraysh found out about this, and they sent an entire army to go and attack the Muslims to protect their own caravan. So this was the wealth of the Muslims. So they're going and now they're like, we're going to have to face this massive army. This is just, this is a huge problem. So what did the Prophet peace be upon him do? He got a promise from Allah and says, this, if you are scared of challenging this entire army that's on the way, Allah is going to send down an entire reinforcement of 3,000 angels that are going to help you. They're going to be like soldiers on the battle. Just to make you feel like it's good. Okay, excuse me, sorry, girls. I'm gonna have to ask you to either please split apart or out outside because it just really annoys me. I cannot continue, you know, the class this way. Thank you. All right, so it's the multitasking problem. So, alhamdulillah, may Allah give us all focus and attention. So, um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, We're gonna send down 3,000 3, angels. Now, this is just to reinforce them, make them feel like, hey, you've got, you've got more supporters. You don't have to worry about the numbers. But they still have to put in effort. They still have to be on the battlefield. They still have to fight because you got to still put in your effort. Allah could have obviously just destroyed the army, right? Allah can do anything. But Allah still, he's giving you some support, but he's not going to just be like, we'll just wipe them all out for you. You all sit down on the floor. You relax. Have a sandwich or something. There was no sandwich. At the time. Have some dates, you know, and just relax. And we'll take care of everything for you. No. Allah wants you to put in some work. You have to, you're going to be tested as well. And then they were still concerned. They said, Bala in in certainly, if you are firm and you are mindful, and you're mindful of Allah, and if they launch a sudden attack on you, then guess what's going to happen? Allah will reinforce you with 5,000 angels that are prepared and set up for battle. So it's like you don't even need, you don't need 5,000. Yeah, 3,000? Allah will even give you 5,000. What are you worrying about? Allah will take care of it. You just got to put in a little effort and he's going to do the rest for you. So this was basically to just reassure their heart to make them feel comfortable. Then is وَمَا جَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بُشْرَى لَكُمْ وَلِتَطْمَئِنَّ قُلُوبُكُمْ بِهِ Allah decided this, meaning this backup army, only is good news for you and to strengthen your hearts. 
So the point was to just make you feel like comfortable you can go and withstand all of these things. Victory comes only from Allah, the mighty and wise. So the key is, you're like, wait a minute, you guys are getting promises that 3,000 angels will come and 5,000 angels will come. But wait a minute, don't think that the angels are going to cause your victory. Victory doesn't come from technology. It doesn't come from numbers. It doesn't come from having a bunch of angels that are there supporting you. It doesn't come from any of these things. It actually comes from Allah. So Allah reminds them and say, you know, we're going to give you this help, but don't think that that's the cause of your victory. The cause of victory is always going to be from Allah. Never forget that. So a very good reminder that everybody needs, because sometimes we start to rely on the means. We start to think, you know what? Because, you know, I, I had all these people with me, that's why we won. Or because I had the technology, that's why I won. Or because we're smarter than them, that's why we won. You're supposed to use all the means but Allah brings about the victory in every situation. So this help was promised about the angels in order to destroy a group of the disbelievers and humiliate the rest of them, causing them to retreat in disappointment. Still the Battle of Badr. What happened in the Battle of Badr? 70 major leaders who have been fighting against Islam. These are the people who were throwing trash at the Prophet. These are the people who threw entrails on the Prophet when he was in the middle of prayer. These are the people who helped try to assassinate the Prophet before he migrated. 70 of them were killed in battle in Badr, and 70 of them were taken as captives. So he's saying this was what Allah wanted to achieve, and it was achieved. And this is exactly what happened. They got uh, justice. You, speaking to the Prophet, you have no say in the matter about what happened at Uhud. Now, Battle of Badr is over. Now we're back to the Battle of Uhud. Remember, started with Uhud, and he said, Remember what happened at Badr? Okay, now we're back to Uhud again. So you have no say in the matter about what happened at Uhud. What happened at Ahud? The Muslims lost the battle. They lost the battle so badly that even the Prophet, peace be upon him, he was injured. He was hit. He was knocked off of his horse. He had chain links stuck inside of his cheek. He is bleeding. The Muslim army retreats. And what's happening is when blood is dripping down his face, he knows that people are going to be punished because this is how they're treating their Prophet that are sent to them. So he's thinking and he's saying, you know what? What's going to happen? These people, they're going to be destroyed. Like this was the last chance that they had to maybe open their eyes and accept Islam. Now look what's going to happen. Like it's a, it's over for them. This is what the Prophet's thinking. Rather, look at the mentality of the Prophet. By the way. Rather than thinking, oh no, we were defeated, we lost. How could this happen? His concern was, these are my people. I've known them my whole life. I've been trying to tell them about Islam and the Quran my entire life. And yeah, okay, we had the first battle and, you know, some of the worst ones died. But now this was another chance for them to wake up and look what's happened. Like, after this happened, they're going to be in big trouble. So Allah responds back to the Prophet and says, you have no say about the battle. You're not going to decide whether they're going to be destroyed, whether they're going to get another chance. Because after you attack a Prophet, usually what Allah does, he destroys those people. He messes with the Prophet. So he's thinking like that. He says, it is up to Allah to turn to them in mercy or to punish them because they're wrongdoers. Allah is going to decide what to do with these people. So Allah can either forgive these people who attacked the Prophet if they regret their actions and they change in the future. Give them some more time. He can punish them right now in this world and just wipe them out because they're wrongdoers, meaning they deserve immediate punishment, but Allah can be merciful. And there's really... You know, subhanAllah, there was a very interesting, very simple quote that I read in one of the books of Tafsir. It just caught my attention. Basically, one of the scholars said, said, the mercy of Allah doesn't require any special reason. But the punishment of Allah, the justice of Allah requires a reason. SubhanAllah. Whenever Allah is going to punish somebody, He always explains, the reason why you're in trouble is because you did this, this. What about mercy? 
Does Allah always need to explain it? The reason why we're going to forgive you is because of this, this, this. Allah's mercy doesn't need a justification. It's just the mercy. So he can forgive whoever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants, and he doesn't need to explain anything to anyone. And just imagine if he did. And I'm just thinking about this. Imagine somebody's wronged you, like done some really bad things to you. You're sitting there and you're like, you know what? Somebody forgives them. Can you, how could you forgive them so quickly? How for, could you forgive them so easily? They did all these bad things and everything. And then imagine if that situation flipped onto you. And you're like, you know what? Hope Allah can just forgive me even though I don't have the great justifications and everything. Kind of mercy is something that it's good that it's in abundance. And punishment and justice, even from our own perspective, it's good that it's it needs some really strong justification and rationale for people to end up in that case. So that's a, that's a mercy from Allah. But here, one of the things here is see, Allah is saying this, right? He can turn to them in mercy. You know what happened? The same guy, Khalid ibn Walid, who launched the 100 horse attack around the hill and went and basically was responsible for leading the defeat of the Muslims at the Battle of Ahad, what happens to him? Only a few years later, what happened to him? He became a Muslim. He became a Muslim. He regretted his actions. And then what did he start doing? He started fighting in the cause of Islam. And he became nicknamed by the Prophet. The Prophet gave him a nickname. What was his nickname given by the Prophet? I'm sorry. Allah. The sword of Allah. Meaning that like this guy is fighting on behalf of the forces of good. So... I mean, imagine the turnaround. This guy basically caused the defeat at the Battle of Uhud, and then he turns around and he becomes the best soldier for the for the Muslims, supporting the Prophet. Even after the Prophet passes away, he still continues. So this is exactly what it is. Allah can decide to have mercy on people and they can become something that you'd never imagined that they would be. Allah owns whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. He forgives whomever he wills. He punishes whoever he wills. So Allah is the one who makes the final decisions about all of these things. Yeah. Allah is forgiving and mercy. All right, questions? They gave different promises, but we don't have the exact number that ended up there. No. I'm sure they were. Sure they were. No, we don't know the exact number. I answered your question on WhatsApp. You didn't like my answer? I'll talk to you privately after. How about that question? So, Isa. How old was Prophet Isa? Uh, yeah, not exactly. All right, so um, the sources don't tell us, like Islamic sources don't tell us exactly how old he was, but some sources say he's somewhere between 30 and 40. Mercy means something between Allah and creation in this context. Yes. Any sisters? No? Okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah, the soldiers were definitely reprimanded in this verse is about that. So this verse is coming up or in another surah. Well, you should do a question. It's coming your hair. Okay, we'll end it here. Hanakallahumma bihamdik. Shadu wa la ilaha illa. Astaghfiruka wa tubulik.